Hello, I'm Paul Rodney, and welcome to this episode of Minnesota Drummer. On this episode, we have percussionist, drummer, educator, historian, and much more. Kelly Ray Tubbs is my guest tonight. Kelly, how are you doing? Hi, I'm great. How are you? Doing fantastic. So exciting to have you on. I've really enjoyed your videos. We'll talk a little bit more about that and have people see some of your videos later on. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Thank you for, for being a guest. Um, so, you know what, I just want to start with the obvious questions and we'll just kind of start with your history, just kind of learn more about you. Um, when did you first fall in love with drumming? I, I, it's a hard question to answer. What I really fell in love with first was music. Okay. So uh, that was when my older brother would play his Beatles albums and he and I would sing, 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 sing all of the backing vocals. And so when I was three and a half, I already knew that I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be one of the Beatles. I didn't <laughs> want to take anybody's place. I just wanted to be a singer. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's where it all started for me. Well, who did you first start? Well, how young were you when you got your first drum kit or snare drummer? Uh, yeah, there was a drum set at the house because one of my brothers had been interested in playing. So it was always there and available by the time I was five years old, okay. probably. And I had a piano in my room, so I was playing that as well. And then I really started um, started in on drum seriously between sixth and seventh grades when school bands started. Now, this is probably an obvious question I didn't even think of asking you. Did you grow up in Minnesota? Uh, my young life, I was in the Chicago suburbs. And then we moved here when I was in third grade. So okay. Did you most of my life has been spent here? Did you study with anybody in town when you first moved here? Uh, no, because I hadn't started yet. Okay. Um, but uh, I was so fortunate. I and I, I didn't really come to realize how fortunate I was. I I knew I was lucky, but like a whole nother level of uh, understanding really came to that. So the teacher that I had for band in seventh and eighth grade uh, was a drummer. Okay. And, you know, not many people have the benefit of having their instructor being their instrument um, player as their, their, their main instrument. And so mm -hmm. uh, every Wednesday after school, he and I would get together and have a half hour lesson uh, for those for two full years of, of school. Mm -hmm. And uh, just amazing amount of just such a solid base to, to, to build off of. And, uh, and the more important part of this, where I really didn't understand until recently, is that, you know, I, I remember that the lessons were $8 a half hour at that time. So, um, so I paid him the first couple of weeks. And then he said, you know, we're here on school property and we're using school equipment. And I can't, in good faith, it would be a conflict of interest for me to, to take money because we're, it's not my stuff. He says, but, but we're continuing lessons, so keep coming. So for literally two years, he gave me drum lessons for free. And it, I really didn't understand what an investment of time he put into me and, and my future. And I, 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 like I say, I just didn't, I didn't. I, I always knew it was lucky, you know, a really super nice thing for him to do. But the, the investment of his personal time has really come to um, not weigh heavily on me. That's, that would be the wrong word. But, it, you know, there's, it comes, um, I, I, I look at him with such respect for having and making the time for me mm -hmm. when he certainly didn't have to. So well, that's obviously fantastic. The first introduction to the love of drumming as well, to have that support had to have gone a long way. Was he, um, uh, did he influence you on some of your styles of music at all or your approach to drumming specifically, your focus? I, I don't think so. It was just a, a beautiful foundation okay. to build off of. And, we, and it was um, uh, concert, concert drumming, not drum set drumming. So very much into the, the fundamentals of the rudiments, um, just, you know, having the best technique possible, which was really great because that helped me then uh, to get into drum corps then when I was in ninth grade and to be in the snare line because I had enough chops to to be there. It's like a ninth grader in a snare line um, 
you know, there, there are plenty of other upperclassmen who would, uh, that would more likely fall into uh, their hands, but, but I was lucky enough because I had that great foundation. So can you tell me a little bit about what you enjoyed about drum corps? Uh, I liked that. Uh, I mean, it, it makes you get your chops together. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's definitely a challenge. The travel is a little bit grueling. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, because you're not, you're not in the comfort, um, not in the comforts of your own family vehicle. You're with a, you know, 140 of your closest strangers <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of friends. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't do it for very long, but um, it was very musically challenging and um, it's always nice to stretch. So did you start playing in bands? Oh, well, I, I, what, at what point did you start playing in bands? Uh, in high school. But okay. Like a little bit in junior high, a couple of little dabblings, but not a full-time band. But um, but then in high school, um, I got together with a couple of other classmates and um, okay. a couple of underclassmen and uh, and myself and a singer. And we we did, you know, kind of jazzier things and some pop things and just a, a nice combination of music that we wanted to do, not necessarily music that anybody else knew. Okay. Who were some of your early influences uh, oh, for drumming? Earliest? would be Ringo Starr, uh, Stuart Copeland, Billy Cobham, um, Buddy Rich. So that's, uh, that's pretty good later. Yeah, pretty good foundation. <laughs> yeah, pretty good foundation. That's exactly right. Uh, Ayrton Moyera. Okay. Um, also, uh, then in later years, um, Chris Layton. Okay. And uh, Daniel Glass. I love his playing. So uh, because he pulls in all of the historical references. He knows how to play this style. He knows um, how, how to really express himself. It's, it all sounds like him, but it's mm -hmm. also authentic to the style. And I have a, a great appreciation for that. We're going to have to talk more about Danny Glass soon here. Um, I'm excited to hear more about what you got going on with him. Um, also, so you kind of play with a historical touch to music what kind of drew you to that uh, you know I, I i'll generalize like dixieland also like historical can you talk a little bit about your attraction to it and this, and really put a thumbprint on the style of music i i actually can do that it's a it's a little <laughs> bit of a long story so pull me out of the details okay go for it you're going too deep but uh, you know i had the idea in uh, about 2007 or so to I, I wanted to have a big band of my own Okay. Because I, I like that music. I love driving a big band. I, I just do. And um, so I started um, thinking about really, really strategizing about what I needed to do to create a big band. And and the name of the group that I finally decided is like I couldn't couldn't really make any progress until I got the name of the band. And the, the name was Swing and a Miss. And I'm the Miss. Right? <laughs> Clever. I like that. That's great. Yeah. Of course, swing music <laughs> and a chick, right? So, <laughs> who also sings? <laughs> yeah, does, that's right. And um, and so I, I I thought about it. Okay, I'm going to need about 200 songs to really have a, a complete library of okay. music to play. And I started looking at how much that was going to cost, even if I bought used charts. And I was like, oh my goodness, I don't want to spend eight thousand dollars on 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 the music. And so I looked for something that was a little bit differently priced. And I found these old charts from the 19 teens and twenties, the old dance band charts that, uh, that you've seen before. Mm -hmm. And, um, if you've ever done any of that kind of music, you don't see it very much now, um, because the arrangements were made for much smaller groups. So mm -hmm. I ended up not going with a 17 piece band, but a 10 piece band and okay. playing those old authentic charts. And if you've ever seen those charts, they're they're written one of two ways um either they're written with quarter notes in the snare drum and bass drum for the entire song and there's no mention of symbols whatsoever or it's written exactly like a sousa march where it's got the whole page it is quarter notes in the bass drum again and then the rest of the page is five stroke rolls for the whole arrangement okay. and i i you know, looking at that music, and first of all, it was really fascinating to catalog it all. 
because you know, you're looking through the horn parts and you're seeing all sorts of inflections in the music for, for smears and for uh, you know, slurs and, and whatever, things like that in the, in the woodwinds. And then in the brass parts, there were, it, it was all about texture. There were mutes on there, you know, the cut mutes and, and hats and straight mutes and harmon mutes and mega mutes. I was like, what's a mega mute? You know, and come to find out a lot of these things are, are obsolete. So they don't even make them anymore. C melody saxophones, they don't make those anymore. You know, but I, I, I just kept falling deeper and deeper in love with just the, the, the sheets of paper. Mm -hmm. and trying to find out what the stories were behind the sheets of paper. Okay. So back to the drum parts for these, these songs where they looked completely ridiculous and made no sense whatsoever um, in comparison to the spangling pattern that we hear in jazz all the time that hadn't been developed yet, number one. Um, but I, I thought to myself, there's, there's got to be something here that I am missing. And for a year and a half, I was asking every drummer that I knew, especially older drummers and retired professors, like, who can teach me how to play this authentically? Somebody out there knows the, the magic and knows the secret to this. And so, uh, you know, you keep asking long enough. And if you are just diligent and tenacious about something, you will find your answer. Somebody will, will come up, bubble up from, uh, from the underbelly of drumming and... and <laughs> And, and uh, yeah, so so that's uh, that's how I was uh, kind of became interested in that old okay. music, and uh, and really wanting very much to be authentic about everything that I did about it. So, so historically, did you go back and um, find original recordings on how drummers composed those songs at all? Oh no, I started looking in for for clues on my own since I. I, you know, couldn't find anybody yet um, in that year and a half. So I started looking into uh, buying old orchestration books from the okay. people who were creating the orchestrations from those charts from the, the teens and 20s and uh, photos and um, uh, other kinds of images and drum method books from that time and the trade magazines from that time and just taking my cue from every little bit of, of um, documentation that I could find. So listening less because it's so hard to hear the drums on so many of those old recordings, but um, really looking for the paper that would tell me a little bit more about that. Well, because from my understanding, during the early 1900s, there were just tons and tons of musicians because of silent film specifically. So there were thousands of people in a town that were constantly working. So were you able to, was it pretty easy to find some of these charts or was it still difficult to find them after all these years? Oh, to find them. Well, tell me a little bit about the hunt. I want to hear about the hunt. Oh, the hunt. Oh, I yeah. love the hunt. <laughs> yeah. I actually have uh, more than 2,500 arrangements of, of this music from most of it from the teens and twenties. Okay. And, and not all of them are tunes that you'd ever hear, but some of them are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's nothing. There's another drummer who is, uh, who has a collection of this same type, same era of music. He's got, I think 12,000 charts. And then Vince Giordano, who's in New York, he's an upright player uh, who leads his own band just, of killer musicians oh my gosh and he's got sixty thousand charts wow which is just amazing yeah so how do the royalties of those original charts go i mean do you have to pay royalties or is it now public domain because it's been so long for mm, those songs a lot, of, a lot of them are within the public domain um, okay but, but yeah i suppose that would be uh collectible you know and some of them uh maybe the copyright hasn't been continued but usually with those old publishing companies mm -hmm. um, all of the rights were purchased in an acquisition like you know like when tams uh and whitmark um uh, uh what is that when they when they come together when they not a merge, merger but oh yeah not necessarily a merge but but when the two companies come together as a coalition of sorts and okay so yeah, so somebody owns most of the rights to those 
okay they are because i don't know i i study silent film so i love that era and that when you talk specifically about the 1910s it was just such an interesting time for um, a new breadth of entertainment due to film specifically yeah. you still had the carryover of vaudeville and so you still had the theater going and then you also had the public performances so uh, it, it just was so magical in my opinion too during that time period because you did have complete orchestras up to of up to 20, 30 people for silent Absolutely. film, right? I've, or I, yeah, I've got some of that music as well. So we'll have to we'll have to have coffee and you can look at my collection. Yeah, that'd be cool. I love that. That'd be, that'd be so awesome. So did that lead to um why you started collecting vintage instruments and looking into the history no, of it? No, that actually didn't have um that it's more the the other way, you know. So in okay. my quest to find um, more information, some of that was to to try to learn through the gear itself. Okay. So I was collecting old drums and um, old sound effects and, and things like that, just to, if nothing else, just to bring them back to life so that people could hear them sing again. It was like, doesn't a, a drum that has been loved enough to last 125 years deserve the chance to be heard? You know, that's kind of oh, my thought. Yes. Yeah. Completely. And, and, you know, Steve Smith recently played an old vintage drum kit from a collector. I can't remember the guy's name. From Tim Northup. Yeah. Yeah. And it was exciting to hear thinking about the historical um with well, the history of it, you know, where did it play, you know. I, Although with I, that That's exactly what I think. It's like and some of my drums I've able um, been able to identify. Okay. Um, I've got a specific bass drum and I was looking at it, turning it, it doesn't have a badge on the inside, no paper label on the inside. And I was turning it, trying to see if there were any remnants of a decal, you know, because mm -hmm. some of the old drums were, were made with decals. And I'm turning it, and then I see this little glint of light. And I look at it, and it's Alfred's name. He has scratched his name into the veneer, his address. So it's like, oh, I know about you now. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so it's been so much fun just to really find out who these people are actually were uh, i've got a photo of one gentleman who's a oh, he's so prim and proper and in his little white uniform head to toe he looks about like the good humor man with a snare drum on and uh and his name is judson courtright and so i'm you know doing my research on judson and finding out he was in um i think elmira new york and was a wallpaper hanger during the day and painter and um and it's just you know, and and you wonder how many how many dances did he play, and mm -hmm. and who who went to see it, and what kind of style, or did he play in the movies? And it's it's just so great to be able to unfold and to bring a personality to these people and to the people who took care of these drums and their families who took care of the drums after those people were gone. Well, what I think is so exciting, looking at the historical aspect of drumming, which you bring up in one of your videos that we're going to play in a little bit, is that history today, people are coming out with new innovations today that were actually invented back in the early 1900s mm -hmm. and, and kind of forgotten about right. and being reintroduced. And I think that's exciting that, you, that you're bringing this to everyone's attention. Um, but one thing I always think about is, is during that time period, uh, they were selling painted calfskin drum heads. Multiple companies were in Lee for a while were coming out with these light up drum heads that would change colors. Do you own any of those or have you ever been able to play one of those? You do. So do. talk to me about that a little bit. That is so cool. Uh, it's a late twenties leady set and it has the typical windmill pattern uh, on the front head. I don't have the lights, uh, but I'd like to get it renovated so that I can restore that part back mm -hmm. to its original uh, condition. But I've got the, the trap table. Um, the temple blocks, you know, I mean, all of the accoutrement that goes with that. And I, uh, I, I, I uh, people are going to think I'm absolutely crazy when I tell this story, but I bought it from a fellow in Ohio. And uh, so, and I also was, uh, got another drum set on that same trip. So I show up and I, and I get a, a drum set, a, a beautiful Thomas set from a, uh, college classmate of mine. Hi, Rick. And uh, so, and it's a 10 piece set. It's a very large set and I am an excellent packer. I've got a very good spatial thing. So this is all in my drum set and I arrive at the second guy's house then to get this other drum set. Mm -hmm. and 
and um, and and all of the extra things that went with it, a couple snare drums and and everything. He's like, I don't think you're gonna get this in there. It's like, oh yeah, I will. There's always room <laughs> for one more thing. So here I am, like driving home. I've got two drum sets, two two large, like you know, 28 inch bass drum on the one, and then 10 piece drum set with the other, and um, and literally i drove from uh from sandusky ohio which is between uh toledo and cleveland i think okay it's, it's uh, pretty close i think to closer to cleveland so i drove all the way across iowa left at two o'clock in the afternoon and then all the way across indiana and then all the way across illinois and i was so excited and feeling so good and so i drove all the way home <laughs> wow yeah that's a long that's a drive. drive yeah that's a drive that was uh i got home at four o'clock in the morning and it was it wasn't until i hit the menominee exit uh in wisconsin that i finally started getting a little a little weary of driving but <laughs> i was so excited i couldn't i just couldn't stop so. well i want to ask you some questions about the drum kit just quickly because um there's some questions i've always had about those kind of drums like so if you look at the vintage drums you look at the vintage tom tom the top head was replaceable, but the bottom head oftentimes were, was riveted on by these little tack, tack uh, screws. Yeah, that's uh, kind of uh, 30s and 40s era. Okay. And wasn't the shell kind of cur like almost, uh, they weren't they weren't the cylinder. They were kind of almost roundish, weren't they? Yeah, uh, some of that uh, was kind of, uh, they were more from the Chinese tom-tom. Um, okay. Which had that curved profile to them. And uh, so it's kind of a transition point between when uh, the small toms were used on on sets and uh, to tunable both top and bottom heads uh, on tom toms and floor toms so th those bottom heads would hold up for quite some time though right it seems like some some of those have lasted all these years well yeah i mean the the lady set that's right here to my side you know that's the that's the original head from that time. The head's a hundred years old. Wow, that's just that is just amazing. We're working on it real close to it if it isn't. <laughs> well, hey, I'm going to take a quick break and allow people to kind of get a little taste of what you've done historically. These amazing videos. If, if people haven't seen these, you've, you've got to see these. Got to go to our YouTube channel. Thanks. It'll be in the show notes. Um, the first one I want to play is your Chinese symbol um, history. Can you please talk a little bit about this video and the history behind it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this this video and, and almost all of the videos that uh, are up on my website, up on my um, YouTube channel, um, they were funded by a grant from the East Central Regional Arts Council. So I have to thank them and all of the Minnesota taxpayers who fund the money that the grants come from, which is so awesome. Because You're welcome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You and, and uh, all of the other people watching. And uh, yeah, so I, I just, I wanted to help people have a better understanding of the components of the drum set and how they were used and where they came from. And uh, just, I, I think people have the, the opportunity to play better when they know better. And uh, when, they, when they know the story behind, whether it's a song that's been written and understanding that, or whether it's something that happened in the studio that that changed how the recording was made. I think all of those things, all of those elements of music, um, including the origins of instruments, uh, just really helps to make a more complete package of, of what you understand about the music and how you can then put that back out into the universe when you play. Fantastic. Well, here's the video. Welcome to this series of videos covering the components of the early drum set. The Chinese symbol comes to us, of course, from the Chinese culture, when an influx of immigrants from China came to the United States. In the Chinese culture, symbols were used to make racket to scare away evil spirits, oftentimes at funerals and celebrations. American politicians in the early 1800s would often use Chinese symbols to bring attention to a political rally or a speech they were giving. 
In August of 1865, the Daily Milwaukee News features an advertisement from the musical instrument dealer Hempstead, which shows Turkish symbols and Chinese symbols being sold. And in 1920, big news was made in San Francisco when an imports dealer, the Sing Chong Company, was in customs court. And the conflict was about import duty tax. You see, manufactured metal was taxed at 20%, but musical instruments were taxed at 45%. With the widespread use of Chinese symbols in jazz bands at that time, you can imagine he lost. Chinese symbols on an early drum set were often found side by side with a choke symbol. Symbol stands hadn't been invented yet, so everything was mounted on the hoop. There were two kinds of mounts. One was more secure than the other. One would hold on to the edge of the counter hoop only, and the other would secure to the counter hoop and the flesh hoop together, making a very tight connection. Although Chinese symbols varied in size, 12 inches to 15 inches was very common. Some symbols were riveted and others were left plain. The most common use of the Chinese symbol in the jazz band setting was as an accent for the afterbeat. In cut time, this would be the and of two, and in common time, 4-4 four, four time, that would be on beat four. And remnants of his early jazz technique still remained in the 1950s, when Bill Haley and his Comets recorded their hit, We're Gonna Rock Around the Clock. In our next video, we'll be looking at the early drum set component that comes to us from the world of livestock management, the cowbell. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the flip side. This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the East Central Regional Arts Council thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. One of our fellow Minnesota drummers needs our help. Eric Ballard's daughter, Emery, has been diagnosed with leukemia. Emery was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia on August 17th of this year. Emery's current treatment plan consists of her receiving aggressive chemotherapy and then a bone marrow transplant. Eric and his family ask that we follow Emery's progress on their designated Facebook page. A link to the Facebook page will be in the show notes of this episode. And they ask that we keep Emery in our prayers that God will heal their daughter. And this is a point where we can help. Any size donation that we can make will help with monthly expenses and medical bills. I ask you to consider any size donation, even a small amount, will help. In these times, I know money's tight. Any size donation is valuable. This is crowdfunding at its best. A link to where you can donate will be on the show notes of this episode. Eric Ballard is a prominent drummer in the Minnesota drumming scene. Please consider donating today. Welcome back. Uh, just one update about Emery. I um, recently read that she's trying a new... Um, regiment so if, again we could keep her in our thoughts and prayers that'd be absolutely wonderful for the the ballard family um so let's get back to your videos i i mean this is what i'm so excited about is uh the historical part of this anybody who's watching this right now we're not going to do the cowbell video but you know what you have to go to the youtube channel you can check it out it's gonna be awesome but can you quickly talk about the choke symbol now that was was that just a term given specifically or it's, uh, it was more of a, a style of playing. So uh, a symbol that's typically 12 inches, that's a, at least a common size, and not used like a ride symbol, but taking the place of that pulse where um, you're, you're playing it open and choked, open, choked, open, choke, open, open, choke. And it really gives a lilting feel to that music, a, a loping feel. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, it's usually sitting alongside uh, a China symbol. Okay. Yeah. It's absolutely fantastic. Because um, I know it was uh, roughly the 1950s and 60s is when we started developing the actual names for a symbol. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, you know, before that, you go into a, a, a drum shop and you say, hey, I want to have a splash. So they put splash on it. I want to ride. You know, that's how that kind of developed. So um, I didn't know if there was a specific term for it if like it was a thicker symbol so you'd hit it, it would just sound like a chick, you know <laughs> oh 
know. I'll tell you what, some of those thicker symbols from back in the day, they really sound rotten by, you know, compared to what uh, we think about a symbol should sound like. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, brass is, uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> well, in your studying, just out of interest, did they, the first thing that came to my mind was, did they import the brass as a raw material after a while and then stamp them in America? So they could get around that tax? Uh, I, I'm not sure if it was that so much as just availability, but it was um, just such a different sound quality. Okay. And I, I think they just wanted a piece of the market, first of all. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and some of those choke symbols are, would be the, the, the closest thing to describe to them would be a paper thin splash symbol, like like take okay. any splash symbol that you have in your collection and then make it thinner. Okay. And, um, and in fact, uh, I had a custom crafted um, symbol made for me uh, by Sabian. So we started with a picante hand splash, which is very thin to begin with, you know, that where you could just take your hands and hit it and, and get the sound from that. And then we laved off more material from both sides, from the top oh, and the bottom. Okay. And, and that, was the closest modern approximation I could get to uh, an old school um, choke symbol. And the reason I did that is because sometimes I have to be sitting in on somebody else's set, you know, a, a backline set. And the old symbols have a smaller spindle hole. So you, you can't get them. You can't, I can't take my 1930s symbols and put them on a drum set because they won't fit. So, wow, what a cool problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool <laughs> problem to have, right? <laughs> Are you endorsed by Sabian? Uh, I'm, we're friendly, you know, definitely friendly. I think I'm considered a regional artist. Okay. Um, in their terminology, I think the language changes from time to time. But, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I love their symbols and I've got, you know, a, a, a very wide range of symbols that uh, they've crafted and it's, it's beautiful. Well, see, I like Sabian for multiple reasons. Uh, for trying new sounds, they really, they're really not inventive, but they really work with artists or individuals, um, artists on different styles. Do you see the symbol that you you were kind of working on as a as a custom one off becoming part of their product line? I I would like to think that that's a possibility. You know, I think with the right kind of marketing for the right kind of people, that that's definitely. Um, something that is just such a niche market. Yeah, it's um, right. not widely available. So is is it something that they would would make? Um, quite likely. Is it something that they would you know advertise in a magazine? You know, for the twelve people who want one. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no I just think it's cool. Um, so just thought of, just speaking of that, how is your orchestra received playing the vintage? Charts. Well, you know, we were really built for dancers. I, I haven't uh, had a gig with them for a long time because I really didn't know what I was going to do, what kind okay. of offers were going to come up and what I might accept. And just like, you know, the last thing I want to do is to take a, take a gig and then say, oh, by the way, you guys have to find your own drummer. Uh, who's bringing the library? Who's bringing the PA? Right. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I won't be around to do it. So I haven't booked the band very much uh, in the last couple of years. But uh, that said, um, we're really built for the dancers, okay. the dancing crowds, and that that music was not was not written like a modern big band chart where it's big and exciting and there's a huge shout chorus. It's 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 um, it's it's it has shout chorus choruses, but not in the same way. It, it's not you know because there you when you're working for that dancing crowd, you can't have tempo changes. You can't have cadenzas that are long and drawn out. It's not kind to the dancers who are standing there. It's like, uh, you know, that, that music, it's, it's kind of like when you have somebody who's got a dollar dance at a wedding that goes on for 45 minutes. And it's like the two people, there's two people having fun. The, the two people who are dancing and that, two might be an overestimation of how many people are having fun. And then you have these, these other 150 people who are like, you know, being so kind and polite. Well, it's the same kind of thing when you're working for dancers like that, where you, you need to be really conscious of the fact that they are there to, to 
dance and and not to sit through a cadenza not to sit through solos they they want to do their steps and they want to do them without trouble well per year what what are the majority of your gigs per year oh goodness um it, that's a really hard number it, it varies so much year to year you know for sure um the last couple of years i've really spent a lot of time being down in um at the Smoky Mountain Opry doing Christmas shows. And so, you know, I'd be doing 106 shows over the course of just a couple of weeks, uh, nine weeks, I guess. And uh, so that that's uh, kind of jam packed. You get kind of tired. Um, I can imagine. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, and it's like, once you start the show, you, you go to bed and it's Halloween and then you wake up and that's the first day of Christmas. <laughs> you've already been rehearsing for two weeks that's yeah. you're now you're doing 12 shows a week uh until you get closer to the holidays so thanksgiving week you're doing 14 shows a week um, christmas week you're doing 14 shows a week and uh, no days off and and you get to learn about yourself you know the first time you do that kind of a contract uh, you get to learn it's like how how am i going to stand this music for you know, the better part of 11 weeks. And for me, yeah. it was really easy. It, um, I liked the music. I liked, I really liked some of the songs. And, um, and then the second year I came back, I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to stand playing some of this music for another 106 shows or, or how many ever shows? A and I still loved it. So <laughs> you know, different, you know, so half a, well, a third to one half of the music was the same. And then, um, then, for the third year then again some of that music was the same the opener of the show was the opener every show but the way that the show would would transition and the songs within those transition segments like the style segment of country there would be a couple new tunes but maybe one that you've done before and and the traditional stuff maybe there's one that's um that you've done before maybe two okay yeah we had mentioned that uh, normally you do some pretty interesting shows this time of year when it's not COVID. Mm -hmm. What are those productions like? Oh, huge productions. So uh, 1400 seat theater, which is uh, amazing with snow machines and uh, the low rolling fog and ramps that go uh, up and down into the stage. They were actually, the, those ramps were actually, um, built for the horses riding down the aisle to get onto the stage. Oh, really? Crazy. Yeah, crazy. Um, there's a, a, a stable right off the side of the stage where uh, there would be tigers for the magic show of tiger and ocelots and ducks and, and things like that. And, wow. uh, and then out in the back behind the building was um, not exactly a pasture, but a, a place where uh the camels were and the burrow and the the unicorn and the little baby unicorn and how does it smell on stage <laughs> uh, with that many animals fine. Okay. Fine. But for, the, uh, for the nativity scene the live nativity for the christmas shows it was just yeah. the camels in the burrow okay but sometimes there was a cleanup on aisle seven but most of the time it was pretty good well that's fantastic um so i want to quickly transition now because i see we're you know, it's so I, I'm losing track of time. I'm having such a great time um, about your the history about I want to talk about Daniel Glass as well as your history of getting into creating these films. So let's first start with these films. What got you into um, wanting to pursue this? It was it was all about authenticity. Mm -hmm. It really is. Is is how do I how do I play this music authentically? And uh, you know, I told you earlier I was. Um, I was, uh, you know, collecting the music and trying to find more about the books and, and asking everybody who can help me find this. So one of my searches, I was looking for, uh, on, I was on Amazon that day, looking for historical drum method. And that's what I put in the search bar. And I, you know, there were some, some books that came up and I had most of them because I've, you know, really been diligent about trying to find, uh, find, find these answers. And uh, it, down at the bottom, it said, people who viewed this also viewed. And it was Daniel Glass's Century Project DVD. And, uh, and so 
uh, and I was reading it and I didn't know Daniel. I didn't, had never heard of Royal Crown Review, didn't know his name, didn't know anything about him, but I'm reading the description. It's like, well, you know, it's, it's, it sounds like, uh, sounds like this is exactly what I want to know. So I, I get that. This is like right before Thanksgiving of 2014. Okay. So, uh, so I get the videos. I've got a Diet Coke. I've got popcorn, hot with lots of butter, copious <laughs> amounts of butter, and uh, and I got the blanket all the way up, and the DVD is on, and uh, and so I'm watching. I'm really super interested because I'm already learning things as soon as I turn this thing on, and then he starts to play, and he demonstrates double drumming. And I literally sit up on, in my uh, from my reclining position on the couch. And it's like, this is the guy. This is the guy who can teach me what I want to know. And okay. uh, and and so right, you know, it's like that. Uh, you you like I say, is if you search and search and search and don't give up searching, you will find the answer. It will drop in your lap when the time is right. Well, how did that inspire? Well, it didn't really necessarily inspire you, but I mean, how did you bring together your your collection of vintage hardware or instruments? So, like in these videos, are all these instruments yours? Yeah, they are, and all of the images, unless otherwise um, otherwise uh, uh, outlined. You know, like there's a, a strip of credit off of the mm -hmm. like upright on one side of of the screen. Um, yeah, all of the images are mine. That was part of my education, you know, trying to find out um, how how these people were, were using these instruments. And uh, it, it just all kind of came together because I was coming at it from so many different ways and boom, here it is. And, and uh, so I was able to get a grant to study with Daniel and, and learn that authentic performance from him. So, wow. so this is all a part of it. So, and the videos then were created for the grant project as uh, a way to demonstrate what I had learned and to pass that forward. That's fantastic. Let's let's start another video. This is a video about the uh, Charles pedal, Charleston pedal. Yeah. Um, I had never even heard of this before. I've seen them, you know, in pictures, but I never knew the significance. Um, so I want to play this video for everyone and. Um, just check it out. You're going to learn a lot. Welcome to this series of videos that covers the transition of cymbals from orchestra to marching band to rock band. In the last segment, we learned how the bass drum pedal condensed the role of three performers down to just one. On bass drum pedals, the clanger device could be engaged or disengaged at will, but doing that changed the musical flow. The drummer could no longer perform rolls or intricate rhythms while he was changing the clanger. Musicians are pretty innovative, and they discovered they could use their free foot to make a cymbal sound with a new device. On April 24, 1925, Victor Burton, a jazz drummer from Chicago, submitted the patent paperwork for a device he called an orchestral apparatus. It was a foot sock symbol that got its name from a dance that was popular in the 1920s. It's the Charleston pedal, sometimes known as the snowshoe pedal. The Charleston pedal was crafted from two wooden boards, a bass and a treadle, which were connected by a springed hinge. A strap kept the drummer's foot in place and a linkage prevented the treadle from springing completely open. On Burton's model, a chain served that purpose, while on the Ludwig shown here, the canvas strap on the side serves that function. The Ludwig model also features a heel rest. But regardless of these differences, the purpose was the same, to make two small cymbals clash against each other without interrupting the flow of music. But the Charleston symbol was cumbersome. It was heavy, bulky, and it didn't disassemble. And for musicians on the move, it means just one thing. It didn't take long before something else took its place. In the next segment, we look at the foot sock symbol that was more portable, the low boy. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the flip side.
This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the East Central Regional Arts Council thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. In the 1980s, Eccentric Systems developed a cam for bass drum pedals, becoming the standard design for many of today's pedals, including the popular DW9000 series of pedals. The Quick Torque Cam is an aftermarket add-on that can be installed on just about any pedal without any permanent modification. Its unique, adjustable design maximizes the efficiency of any force you apply to the pedal, returning the beater 30% faster while providing more impact. This is a cost-effective way to breathe new life into your existing pedals. Be eccentric. Visit eccentricsystems.com to get yours today. Welcome back. Fantastic video. Uh, I think it's exciting to learn more about the history of the hi-hat, which we're going to go into the playing the low boy video here in a couple minutes. But then you'll have to check out the high boy, which is our modern-day hi-hat symbol, uh, by going to your YouTube page and checking out some of the other videos. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about where did you accumulate these instruments from? Yeah, eBay. Oh, really? That's nice simple. All things great and <laughs> wonderful. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, eBay mostly. Um, antique stores for some of the things. Um, Goodwill. Oh my gosh, I went to. <laughs> I, I went not not Goodwill, but uh, the local thrift store here in town, uh, where I'm at. I, I went to the store and I saw these drumsticks that were sitting there and I picked them up. They were really super dark wood. I picked them up. I was like, oh my gosh, these things are so heavy. They were $2.75 and I left them there, right? Well, a couple of weeks later, I get the photo, the, 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 uh, the photograph of actually one of the guys that's in the, in the video, the introduction to the, the video series. He's sitting there all prim and proper with his uh, with his sticks, and you can really see them, and you can see the 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 taper of the shoulder of the stick and the the tip shape. And I went back to that store a couple of weeks later. I, I I thought about it, and it's like, oh my gosh, those are those are that kind of stick, right? So I go back; they are still there, believe it or not. A, a pair of two dollar and seventy five cent drumsticks right uh, be probably because they were so heavy and i later realized that they were made of rosewood which is why they're oh. so yeah they're, they're beautiful sticks and uh, it was a uh, 25 percent off sale that day so <laughs> <laughs> you a better deal <laughs> yeah and and it was, it was just crazy so crazy luck um sometimes people hold things out for me because they know i'm collecting um like i got a uh, uh, a music stand that people drummers would wear on their uniforms and and uh, a, one of the guys uh, actually the operator of the delaware drum show he's like i've got something for you i think you're gonna want this and it's like yes yes i want this so well did you were you able to date those sticks at all or find out the manufacturer no nothing like that um but they're they're from the early 1900s 1900 1910 give or take wow yeah. um but what i'm really blown away about oh, is not only this this uh charleston pedal but also your low boy is in such amazing condition yeah absolutely i've just gotten really lucky with that i've um sometimes um sometimes uh you know things are restored back to whatever kind of condition they they do but um sometimes people really work hard at oh you know sometimes changing i think uh, things and i just leave things as they are if they're they're rugged and rotten guess what that's the way they're going to be um mm -hmm. i just want them to be what they are you know so i've just gotten really lucky and um with with all of the things that i've purchased so, to you what is your most interesting piece in your collection uh i have a snare drum that dates back to 1887 wow and that's pretty special uh, i like that i was able to refurbish that with some grant money so i i was able to um get the calfskin heads from stern tanning in milwaukee and get got snares and refurbish all of that and then i've got another one that's right here 
if I can. Ooh, show and tell, show and tell. A little bit of show and tell. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this one dates back to um, 1892. And uh, it's a Prussian style um, snare drum. That, that's the kind of tuning system here. If you can see that. And um, obviously the, it, it came, it was made for marching. So it's got this hook here that you would hook to your strap. And then this leg rest that's already built into the drum. So it's really quite amazing. And you can hear it on one of the videos that I've made, uh, one of the Revival Series videos. But I must say, I think I did a pretty good job here um, lacing up the gut snares. So I was really pleased with how that turned out because I had not done that before. But I got some killer, killer um, instructions on how to do that. Um, from from the the company that I bought the gut snares from, so it's uh, it's it's fun to to go oh. through that process. Sorry, I realized that when I put you screen, you can't hear me. I apologize. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when I be able to see the the strainer and the butt on how you connected the the, I, I'm gonna make you full screen again. So. Yep. No, that's fine. So the um the butt ends on these the the butt plates are it's just a strap of leather that has been. Um, had holes punctured into it so they thread through there i have actually four individual strands of gut um, which then makes eight snares and then the snare strainer itself is uh, just a really simple screw mechanism that has uh, threads down at the bottom which way am i turning um, has threads at the bottom so it it pulls up that cross piece. So if I turn oops, wrong side, if I turn this knob, then the snares tension or loosen. Kind of hard to see, but I, I can see it. I can see it. Yeah. That that is so cool. So historical. It is pretty fascinating. And the um it's a single rod tension drum, meaning that if you tension the, the tension rod, both heads tighten or both heads loosen at the same time. So what's the shell construction like? It is, um, boy, I haven't taken it apart in a long time because usually once I get it in, you, you, given that it's calf skin heads, mm -hmm. it seats um, to its own, it, it, it makes its own seating. So I try not to mess around with that too much. But um, it's typically a, like a, there's a bird's eye maple veneer on the outside. And a lot of the drums from this time, a lot of them um, may have been mahogany and, and other things. I didn't really, you know, look too much into that. I, I probably should have, but I didn't. Yeah. But I have, you know, another 17 or 20 of them to refurbish. I'll, I'll, uh, bring you in on the next one I do. <laughs> oh, you know, honestly, I, I try to do videos periodically. It would be fun to see you refurbish if you would be open to that because oh, it would be cool to see because, because looking at the history, history to see how our shell has, you know, evolved, you know, they were making them like Noble and Cooley is the first company that comes to mind is making, been making them pretty much authentically. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I know that some of the drones back then were ply and some were just solid. And uh, okay. it's just kind of interesting in the metal, of course, but um, it's just it's just fun to think about historically that ultimately things have not changed much except our ability to tune and have a little bit more higher, you know, quality of lasting. Um, right. It's standardization it, of sizes. So this yeah. this drum right here, I think, is uh, like a 15 and three eighths or something like that. <laughs> OK, like, everything is, is a different size. It, and um, interesting. Yeah, it, you know, but it, it didn't matter what your final size was so much as long as you had um, counter hoops that were made to fit it because you're making a flesh hoop and you're making your own drum head. So it's not like you have to, you're, you're not, not like you're going to a store and buying something that's pre-made. You're, you're, you're handcrafting it. So okay. with this one, um, I... I made the drum heads on my own. I had grant money to to take lessons from a guy on how to tuck the heads, which wasn't too difficult. Oh, well, that's really cool. Yeah, here in town, and um, and so I uh, so so um, I did those um, on my own, and um, and again, stern tanning, you know, 
um, sent me the rounds with for that and I made it on my own. Um, and that process is actually in the revival video as well, where I've got some still clips and showing the process. Now, uh, the, the lesson did not go too well because um, the, the mentor was uh, cutting some of the excess material off and cut about a quarter inch too much, oh. which meant that I couldn't tuck it. I couldn't get it around the flesh hoop when I was making the drum head, or he was showing me how to make the drum head. So I actually had to take that original one home and put it on a smaller flesh hoop that I had for another drum that I needed to refurbish. And then when I finally got new uh, rounds to make this one with, I was so afraid to cut it. So there's like so much extra <laughs> skin on this flesh hoop. It's, it's, it's a really horrible job in that regard, but it sounds fine. So, so um, a while ago I had on another local drummer who kind of made a, a name for himself working at the Thompson's drum shop. His name's Ollie oh. Manley. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Oh, I probably met him a long time ago. But, but he probably. used to, well, he was a, one of the gurus in town that would do caskin heads. Mm -hmm. um, and he talked about how you had to be really careful, especially during the winter, because they would crack. Mm -hmm. So he used to take rags and put them on. He used to tension them, tuck them, and tension them, mm -hmm. and then uh, put rags on, on there that were wet to let them sit overnight until the tensioning adhered. Yeah. Um, do you do anything like that as well? or? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. So, well, I guess we'll have to watch the video. I want to ask you all these questions now. Let's all watch the video. We got to move on, anyways, because we're almost coming up in an hour here. Um, so, can you uh, and jump quickly now to Daniel Glass? Yeah. Talk to me about um, just quickly. You, you alluded to how you met him through your um, grant. Yeah, I, I bought his video and and was just so amazed and uh, was able then to get a grant to study with him and and I've actually received several grants to study with him and um, and to learn how to play you know all of these different variations of that very early jazz authentically and it's it's just been such a treat you know he is such a fount of knowledge and um, it's it just inspirational for the level of quality in everything that he does well how did that turn into working with him for the the postcard project a snapshot of the drumming life from the 1900s to 1930s it's a, it's a great story. I had um, a, a couple of images that I had bought on eBay, right? And uh, and I asked a question. I actually, I showed him the, the guy of, of uh, with that all white uniform and I'm holding this, this photograph up to the camera lens. And it's like, what is this thing on his snare drum? And he's like, well, I, I don't know. It's, it's probably this, because he hadn't seen one of those either. And, uh, and then it's like, all right, well, I'm you know, kind of satisfied with that answer. I, I later learned it was called a snare symbol. Okay. It's a, it's a little bell that it looks like a telephone bell, actually. And it just sits on the frame. It's mounted to the counter hoop, wooden counter hoop. Um, but then I had a couple of other images that I didn't understand what it was. So here's, here's my answer, man, right? So, so I hold it up. It's like, what, what's this thing? And uh, he says, well... You know, maybe it's this. It's like, no, it's not that because that's what this thing is. So I'm show, showing him image number three at this point. And he's like, show me the first one again. And the second one and the first one. And we're going back and forth and back and forth. And he finally says, he says, you know, how many of these do you have? And I said, well, you know, images like this that feature musicians, uh, drummers specifically. I said, I don't know, probably 50, 60. And he says, we need to write a book about this. Oh. And it's like, okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna say no. <laughs> so yeah, it, so it was it was just totally his idea. Um, but I had started this, you know, like I say, trying to trying to learn more and and uh, at this point now I've got about four hundred images of drummers. Wow. Um, from uh, that dating from 1904 to 1928, give or take, and then a few that lie outside of that time frame. So what um, will it be covering the drummers themselves? Some of it will. When we're able to identify who the drummers are, then, yeah, we're going to go. I, I, I want to go at least a little bit and say who they are, where they were, what kind of music they played with. Uh, played and the bands they played with. And, uh, and I'm able to find some of that information for some of the people. So, See that that part is 
that's that's fascinating that you can actually go back and and get that information all these years later i think and that's cool to get a snapshot of what the world was like back then which is my fascination with with silent film sure. you know yeah. um it, it's just uh it seems so different but yet it's still the same and it's like we keep on repeating the same mistakes decade after decade thinking that we're experiencing something new but it's been done right. forever and, and for all of the times that drummers have said oh there goes our jobs right well you know it was a you know currently it's loops and and things like that right, right? And, and sampled drums well but before that it was assumed drums and, and you know that was going to change everything and then before that um back in 1900 give or take 19 teens it was the whirless or organs because they had uh, automatic drums mm -hmm. um, in there so it's like our our jobs have been and then the talking movies of course that uh, took right. away uh, the silent film drummers jobs but uh, but we're still here we're still drumming there's still plenty of work for us to do so mm -hmm. it's no, but nobody's job is going anywhere when will we see this book uh we are hoping to get this done in 2021 and um I finally found a, a a software program that would allow me to pull all of my research together in a way that I could actually see it and work with it. Okay. And that has made all of the difference. So, you know, some of the some of the documentation is in an email, some of it's a video, some of it's another picture, some of it's a newspaper article, and, and just trying to put all of those sources together and then keep the image fresh uh, can be really tricky. So um that had slowed me down for quite a while just trying to be able to organize all of that much um all of that kind of information and from so many different sources but and then the books and things like that mm -hmm. that i've got so it it has been full steam ahead for me so it's been it's been really wonderful to get back into the groove again of uh, meeting pretty much every week to to make forward progress on that and, yeah. and, and uh, to kind of um figure out what kind of category that it, this fits best under. What kind of story does this tell and what other um, images do I have that, that support the telling of that story and to show how, how globally appreciated um, music is and, and how important drummers are to all of that. Well, it'd be fun that I'm looking forward to this book, especially if you're gonna be approaching it like you're approaching your videos. It gives a lot of historical value as well as a snapshot into somebody's life or a generalization of what you know a drummer was experiencing during that time period right and and all of it leading up to the drum set of course mm -hmm. so um or at least most of it and so uh it, it's just uh, it, it, we both kind of think of it as a as a cross between a coffee table book because it's going to have some amazing photographs in it okay and then uh and then the deep dive that i like to do so it's a it's a, a hybrid of both of those kinds of feels fantastic well hey let's quickly play the low boy video and then when we come back i'm going to ask you a complete avant-garde question that has nothing to do with anything we've talked about awesome okay okay yeah. so here's the low boy part two video of the evolution of the hi-hat Welcome to this series of videos that covers the transition of cymbals from the orchestra to the marching band to the rock band. In our last segment, we learned that drummers used their free foot to play a foot sock cymbal called a Charleston pedal, also known as a snowshoe pedal. It was played on the afterbeat to create a back and forth stride that was perfect for the swing and music of that time, hot jazz. Charleston pedals were dependable, but they were bulky, heavy, and didn't travel easily. And that means one thing, something else would take its place. A Swedish immigrant and co-founder of Wahlberg & Auger, Barney Wahlberg, designed another foot sock symbol in the late 1920s, which was more portable and achieved the same afterbeat sound that the Charleston pedal did. It was called the Low Boy. The Low Boy was quite simple by design. It consisted of a combination base and heel plate, a treadle style footboard which links to a compression spring inside the vertical riser, and a movable post that holds the cymbals in place. When the foot is raised, the spring inside the tube extends to its normal length, which brings the top cymbal back to playing position.
This design was much better for professional drummers on the go. Once the cymbals were removed, the stand folded down for easy and lightweight travel. This little boy was designed to accommodate the larger cup frequently found on American-made stamped brass cymbals that, to some, resembled hats. The stamped cymbals did not have the same sound quality as other cymbals made of copper alloys, and just like today, the prices reflected the quality. Generally speaking, the cymbals used in the 1920s were smaller in diameter, often just 11 or 12 inches, which was perfect for the modern dance orchestra, which often employed 10 musicians, not 17 like today's jazz ensembles. In the next segment, we'll talk about the foot sock cymbal that was designed to be played with drumsticks, the hi-hat. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the flip side. This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the East Central Regional Arts Council thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Minnesota Drummer is expanding drumming news. We are proud to announce the addition of Drumming News Network. There have been many requests to feature global drumming information artists, and product releases on Minnesota Drummer. Minnesota Drummer's vision is to stay focused exclusively on Minnesota Drummers and the Minnesota Drumming community. Please visit our new website, drummingnewsnetwork.com, and please be sure to like us on Facebook. Thank you so much for your continued interest and support. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed these videos. I love these videos. Um, again, to check out how the, the last final stage of the hi-hat came about, go to your YouTube. I have included the link in the description of this show as well as what's posted on Facebook and YouTube. So you have no excuse. Um, <laughs> you have no excuse. Well, you awesome. know. That is totally awesome. And, and I would love to say, you know, I like to use my old gear whenever I can in mm -hmm. when it is safe for me to do that. So when I am on uh, percussion gigs where I'm using my cajon, I actually bring my low boy and I play this. So it's like, so here's this 125 year or whatever, 100 year old instrument. And here it is right on stage. It's like, it, it was made to be used, you know. Really. That is so cool. And do you have you ever do you have the the uh, DW version of that? I don't. I don't. Okay. I've seen it. I saw it at the NAM show. Yeah. Um, and when it's like, oh my gosh, everything old is new again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, but I don't have one. And how's the action on the the old one? Like, does it feel pretty consistent with a modern hi hat? No, no, it's it's a different feel, but it's not bad. It's just something different. Okay. You just have to get used to it, and it's got a just a. It's not a. You can't change the tension on the spring, so what you get is what you get. And the post, if once you start playing it, the, the upright post kind of goes, <laughs> so kind of starts, you know, you can, it, it's, it's easy and it's, it's made to do that because it's foldable to go in your overcoat pocket, you know, okay. and, um, but it, it just, it, it, it's, it's once, once it gets to a certain point, then it stops moving, you know, I mean, in a good way, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't keep tilting until it finally falls over, it just tilts a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it, it doesn't impact your playing so much of it because, you you know, you're just, I don't know. It's a wonderful thing. Um, just one other question going back to your sock pedal, mm -hmm. you know, the original one. I noticed that on the inside of the, the pedal that's holding on the uh, the symbols themselves are wing nuts. Are those the authentic wing, nut, wing nuts? Oh, yeah. I know it sounds strange, but it's, it's kind of cool to see that, I mean, that wing nut has been, was used all the way up to really like Ludwig single brace hardware that was flat brace lace hardware mm -hmm. up through the 70s up, or early 70s late 60s right, right. yeah so yeah it's, it's user. all as original as it can be um, for mm -hmm. everything that i've got you know some people when they're restoring their old drums they will actually change the bearing edges mm -hmm. and i don't have the heart to do that you can't undo that right and it's great for the people who want to do that with their own stuff um i just i i don't want to do anything that can't be undone and um, so I'd rather just have a clean antique, even if the sound is not as good. Mm -hmm. I, I want it to be authentic. So that, that really is the key word for me is authenticity. 
Have you had an opportuni opportunity to check out the new ANF drum hardware that's based on old hardware? I have not. No. Are you familiar with the ANF drum company? I am. I, I think they're doing some really cool stuff too. And uh, the owner, which I forgot his name, um, there is a story about this on the Drawing News Network. You can check it out. Um, not to, you know, promote, yeah, but I'm no, going to promote. I, I'm I'm <laughs> no, but if you go to the, after we sign off. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you go to the, the website for ANF Drums, um, the owner went through uh, and bought up a whole bunch of vintage har hardware and created his own new line of vintage hardware. This is very influenced that way, but it's more sturdy, stable, mm -hmm. more reliable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have yet to touch it, but everything he's done so far, I've loved. And oh, yeah. Um, he's just, I think he's really onto something really cool with his approach. It's very, you know, you have to be looking for that kind of instrument, right. but I think it's really cool. I think the inventiveness is there and, and, uh, encouraging everybody to just check it out. Nothing else. Yeah. Oh, I look forward to seeing that. All right. So here's my question. This is the, yeah. the one, the final, the final question I got for the show. Um, around in, ending the year with the top 10, you know, uh, best drummers in the world so we just did it for the men and there was one for women that's coming up and um i kind of decided to pull the story because frankly they left out a whole bunch of great drummers <laughs> i mean i'm just like come on like you know it was, it's a it was nothing more than a popularity contest so in your opinion mm. i want to get your top at least five female drummers of today and yesterday oh i got one more question after that I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk to you about Viola. So we'll talk about yeah, her afterward. Well, that's exactly where I was going. Viola okay. Smith was, um, if, for people who don't know about Viola, let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, she recently passed away just before her 108th birthday, which is just crazy. And um, she was a drummer. She, start, she was from Mount Calvary, Cavalry, Calvary, Calvary. Wisconsin and uh, grew up playing in a band with her sisters, six of her sisters. And she was the last one to get assigned an instrument. So she uh, and her father had drums set aside for her. So uh, they went and played. She, she took her initial lessons from a cousin who was a drummer in the area. And they, starting when she was at about age 12, age 13, she would then go on tour with her sisters during the summer when school was out and, and they played a, a really good region. And, um, and they, they won, they were so good at um, all of the sisters that they were hired then by the major Bose amateur hour, which is basically the, um, the beginnings of the gong show. So people, uh, amateur talent would come on to the show they would get uh, gonged off or they would stay to, to finish out their song. And the winner of the show would then go on tour for a week. And the Schmidt's sisters, Smith's sisters um, orchestra was the major bows uh, orchestra going from town to town, week to week, um, you know, for as long as her contract lasted. And, and so she, she, you know, started with the sisters, doing dances and weddings and things like that went on to this major touring uh, thing. Uh, I don't know exactly when that lasted, but maybe until about 36 and then uh, created her own band called the Coquettes. She was president of that went on to work with the Phil Spitalny orchestra who, uh, you know, she played uh, Truman's second inaugural ball and the other wow. talent at the inaugural ball was I think the Tommy Dorsey band Duke Ellington and Benny Goodman if I'm if I'm remembering that correctly and Sounds then, right. as if that wasn't enough right um, she goes on later to oh, she she played in the I think in the NDC orchestra for a little while she studied with Saul Goodman with um, Billy Gladstone and with Ted Reed. And then, uh, you know, playing all the New York clubs and things like that, and then uh, landed the job playing in the original, uh, the original group, uh, Broadway group for Cabaret. Tony Award winning with Joel Gray, and you know, she's outlived almost all of the people in the cast. Right. 
and Didn't you... uh, just one what, what an amazing career that literally spanned five decades and there's there are a few drummers alive today whose careers have really spanned five decades and especially with that kind of national touring and recognition so what a phenomenal player well she was was considered to be one of the world's fastest drummers for a while wasn't she she yeah she they they liked to call her the female jean krupa okay and um and so she was an early endorsing artist for several different companies and uh, she was on the cover of billboard magazine i think in 1940 and wow. it's like it's crazy you know to well, have had... your, your career start when you are at age 12 and um that was about 1923 give or take and uh and to have this beautiful career that literally that literally lasts until the 70s when when uh, she left the broadway show and then to still maintain that kind of notoriety and it's actually grown over the past years as as um video of her has become more prevalent and and more accessible and it's like what a showman oh holy smokes <sighs> <laughs> I, I was so blown away by seeing her videos. So inspirational. She had overhead toms. I think that's so awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also she had such a, a variety of, of instrument sounds and tones in her set. I mean, it was just, it was phenomenal. And she was in an Ab Abbott and Costello film. Uh, yeah, two. She was in two films. She was in Here Are the Co-Eds, Here, Here Come the Co-Eds. Uh -huh. And there's another one, which the, the title of which I forget. But... Is it something Hollywood? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, I just thought that was cool because I love that about Costello too. So. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Did, did they start in the silent films? No, they didn't come. They were out of the vaudeville circuit, but they didn't really start till the forties. Gotcha. Um, but just a couple more things about I, I. I always wanted to meet her. I always wanted to interview her, and I never did, and I feel really bad about that. Uh, was what was wonderful. she like? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Daniel Glass and I uh, went out there and uh, I spent two afternoons with her. He was able to join me for the second one. And I showed her, you know, a lot of people that, well, I, I researched her before I ever had the opportunity to sit with her and saw the kinds of questions that people were asking her and the answers that she had. And, and a lot of people asked the same questions. So mm -hmm. I already knew those answers. Right? Right. I didn't need to ask those things again for myself. So I brought photos of of um, drummers from that same era. Oh, cool! And uh, and you know, we were talking about. Um, I, I showed her one photo of um, of an opera house in Nevada, and you know, asking you know how is this similar to the opera house that your family operated in Wisconsin, and how is it different? And I showed her the picture. She's like, "Oh, that looks just like ours." You know, so it was really exciting to like take her home for a minute. Um, you know, just even though it wasn't the same place, it was similar enough to it that it made her, you know, those old memories come up. And and so she begins to tell me about all of the the, the groups that used to come through there and perform there at her opera house and. Uh, you know, so sometimes they would have chairs and tables on the dance floor for wedding parties. Sometimes they'd put all the chairs to the side for dances or they'd bring the, the, the seating and watch movies or concerts or something like that. And, and she begins to tell me that there was one, she says, oh, there was one trumpet player, one orchestra, you know, um, that would come up from Chicago and play at their opera house. And she she got to hear this trumpet player warming up and she was she said that, that you know that i've never heard another player another cornet or trumpet player play it, it was so beautiful i've never heard anybody play like that before and she couldn't come up with the name right away mm -hmm. and um and then she says oh i know who it was it was bix Beiderbeck. it's like holy smokes how many i'm not familiar with them live? oh uh, uh, amazing early jazz player okay and uh to you know to think that there's somebody alive who heard Vic spider back i think he died when he was 26 so oh. that's a really small crowd of people who right who uh yeah who who could say i saw him perform so, so did like when you brought up these pictures did she 
talk in depth about the players themselves? Did she recognize a lot of the players? Uh, well, no, a lot of the players were just people who I can't even identify yet. Okay. But it was more like, what's this? Did, did you ever use this piece of equipment? Did you okay. ever do this? Did you ever use one of those? And, um, and a lot of times, uh, you know, it's like, oh, you know, she, she'd look at and, and look at their hands, you know, and make an assessment. It's like, oh, that that person really knows what they're doing. You know, just like <laughs> we would, right? Yeah. It's like, like, look at those hands. Those, those are great. And, uh, and then other times she would say, oh, no, I played something that was exactly like that. I had that piece of equipment. Okay. And we would talk about that. And it was so great uh, just to, to, to have, all, I, I, you know, it was kind of like working um, – uh, working with uh, with a like a Ken Burns film almost, okay. you know, <laughs> it was like because right. here's this encyclopedic knowledge of so many different ways to perform on drums and so many different experiences with really um, great foundation behind her and and all of you know how many how many people do you know um, when they're in high school or or just out of high school or touring the U S not a lot right oh, um crazy did she did she have well wait, hold on let me back up is any of that documented and will we see any of that in this book coming up or a different book or uh, video probably in an article so okay. uh yeah it, it's a lot of it was just kind of research just to kind of help us understand what we had in the in some of the photos somebody who was actually alive to mm -hmm. be able to tell us things like that in those photos. Um, but I did record um, both audio and video, even though it was not meant ever to be um, presented as a video, but to get the information out of it and to share okay. that. Yeah, it'll, it'll surface. Awesome. Looking forward to that. <laughs> That's sort of good. Maybe, um, maybe on, uh, on, on your sister channel. That would be absolutely fantastic. Please, let's make that happen. <laughs> Did she have any gear from her early days left over, or was that all gone? Uh, there is a drum set, uh, and I I believe it's with a cousin in New York. If that drum set still exists, I'm not sure. And I don't know what era it's okay. from. I don't know if it's got the raised toms on the sides or if it's maybe the set that she played when she was in cabaret. Okay. I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, and I don't have that answer, but I know that there is something I am trying to encourage the family to please get this into a museum. Yeah. I will help you find a museum to, <laughs> to put this in. Um, I did get to see the, the snare drum that Billy Gladstone gave to her. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, so that was a real treat just to like, <gasps> you know it's almost well, singing on its own right right there's the history again the history of it right. a legend right. yeah it's like yeah dealt like a double legend because it's this billy gladstone snare that what one of one of 15 i think wow that were made and he presented it to her so and it's got a little name plate on it where he uh, had dedicated that drum to her huh. for her yeah Wow. Right. So this is going to be a tough follow-up now, but can you please give me five drummers that you think are, you would consider to be the five top female drummers in the world? And I know it's bias and it might be of today, but what, well, who would you choose? You know, um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't think exactly in those kinds of terms. There are a lot of people with a lot of talent uh, who are unrecognized, you know? Um, yeah. But, I, I guess known people. Viola, yeah, clearly Viola is is at the top of my list. I, I think it really depends. You know, are you looking for something that is really um, beefy musically or beefy technically or or whatever? Because Emmanuel right. Caplet has these amazing chops, but uh, Kimberly Thompson has a really great feel, and you, you know, so it really it's not. It's, it's not really, um, it, it's, it's hard for me to really make a decision, you know, and, and people who don't have a name like Sheila Early, who um, she studied for uh, with, with Jeff Hamilton and okay. also with Alex Acuna. And uh, she doesn't talk much about herself. So Sheila, sorry, I'm outing you on, uh, on how <laughs> great you are. And uh, because she will not ever tell you um, 
you know, to come and see this show, you just kind of have to learn it sideways and then show up and, and she amazes every time. So, you know, that's somebody who doesn't have um, a, a, the national recognition, but man, is she a great player. So, Where does Karen Carpenter fit? You know, uh, she fits in a, in a position where in my mind that, that I, I remember, you know, seeing snippets of the show uh, but she was marketed so much as a singer that a lot of people really missed out on how fantastic of a drummer she was. Because I know I missed out on on how fantastic of a drummer she was. All I remember hearing is is um, you know not great remarks. You know, and then I go really? back, yeah, I go back later and and see the videos, and it's like, why why would people? Why would, how could they have said she was anything less than amazing? She was a monster. Her hands right. were right. ridiculous. Right. But, but it, you know, in sad to say, but the, the, the gender bias mm -hmm. was that deep. Right. I'm, I'm, yeah, that has to be, has to play a big role in it because I, I just, I mm -hmm. learned more about her as a player in the, in the, you know, let's say 2005, 2010 mm -hmm. to really get, you know, cause that's when a lot of the videos on YouTube were coming out. Exactly. I was just floored when I saw her doing some of her solos. They're, you know, they're of Buddy Rich, in my opinion, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, um, you know, it was a very unfair and biased question because it, it is so hard to tell. But when I when I saw this top 10, I just kind of refused to, to promote it because there's so many other drummers that I think should be recognized mm -hmm. um, that are not that are known and unknown. But right. Um, right. it's just, uh, yeah, there. So can you give, tell me this? Who are five drummers today? that are influencing you? Oh, like currently? I, um, you know, I'm going to have to put Daniel Glass at the top of that list. And Jim Mola, who's also out of New York, he's got this uh, amazing mind for music, you know? Okay. Um, and, and, and just expressing things in a different way that I've, than, than I had thought about them or it didn't have access to people who had that kind of insight into music and in, in the way that he does. Mm -hmm. um, Billy Cobham, still amazing. Holy crap. Still amazing. You, know? you met him like you, you, do you, do you know him or did you just meet him a couple of years ago? No, I, uh, I actually went out. I, I'm a, a perpetual student. Okay. So uh, no matter what it is, I've, uh, as an adult, I've gone to jazz band camp in Wisconsin and a couple of years out in California um i've been taking lessons uh, currently um, from daniel glass and also from brandon ku in in uh, singapore okay so that that's fun you know, like that lessons start at midnight right <laughs> <laughs> and um and uh, so i went out to uh, two years consecutively to his uh, art of the rhythm section okay um, retreat which was awesome because you're sitting there playing i think anytime you have the opportunity to play with people who are better than you it's such an, a, a wonderful opportunity to learn, to mm -hmm. learn about yourself to learn about what they know and that you missed out on at some point and so uh so i went out there it was uh, six days each of the two summers that i went and here i am playing with billy cobham's band you know it's like it wow matter. Yeah, exactly. And and those guys in their own right have these amazing resumes. And, uh, you know, it's like, hey, can you guys help me with this shuffle? Right. <laughs> yeah. Can well, everything I know about Billy, well, anything I know about Billy, you, you got to be the best. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It's um, and, and all of those guys are so great. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just lingering. Uh, you know, one of the one of the best lessons I've ever had uh, was actually with the bass player Rick Fiorachi. Okay. Uh, because for me, it's like, uh, you know, I can I can learn how to play drums from a, a drummer, but I can learn how to play with a bass player, with a bass player. Okay. So you know, and somebody who really knows how they like to play with a drummer and. Um, what they what they want to feel and it's like if you change that thing that'll feel better for me as a bass player and uh, so yeah it's like any any time it's like give me anybody to study with I'm happy to do that <laughs> pretty much. Well, fantastic how about we end here uh, this has just been such a joy to talk to you get to know you more learn more about your stuff 
can you please tell us where we can follow you um, to learn more about you? Yes, I would be happy to tell you that. So um, if you know my name, Kelly Ray Tubbs, you can misspell it any way you want uh, in Google. You will find me. I promise you, you will find me. So kellyraytubbs.com is my website. Uh, YouTube forward slash Kelly Ray Tubbs will get you to my YouTube channel, which has all of my historical videos and a couple of performance videos. And um, you can hear me on the Waltzing on Waves CD, which was released. It's a Minnesota artist um, on five cuts of that with drums or percussion or both. And um, where else? Uh, I, I tweet rarely, but I'm there. And you can find me on my Facebook page. Uh, my um, musician page is uh, facebook.com forward slash Kelly Ray Tubbs Drums. All of those places and maybe more. Send me an email. I'm happy to, uh, I love talking with people about drumming. And so send me an email. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. You have a wonderful evening. I'm excited to hear about the book. See what you're going to be doing in 2021. As soon as we all, this COVID goes away, I'm excited to see things getting back to normal again. Sure. And again, I, I'm, I'm enthused by your collection and your, your you. general interest and love for the history of drumming, as well as just your knowledge of it. It's just, it's exciting. So thank you very much for your time tonight and uh, you take care and thank have a great you. weekend. Thank you so much for inviting me. I have loved this. So awesome. Thank I, you. I, I hope, yeah. I hope that someday you have somebody who has to cancel last minute and you can like call me up. Hey, <laughs> yes, of course I can. Well, let's do it then. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Opening beats provided by Alec Tackman. You too can own this fantastic multi-volume library of live drum loops and samples. Whether you're a drummer looking for new ideas or you know a songwriter looking for a drum loop library, this is the library you're looking for. Support a local musician and drummer, go to Alec Tackman's website. That is www.alectackman.com. Spelled A-L-E-C-T-A-C-K-M-A-N-N. -N. Are you looking for a drum instructor that will help you find your own musical voice? Whether you're a beginner, advanced, or in between, the David Stanek School of Drumming offers an experienced and professional approach to help you take control of your drumming. David served on the faculty of McNally Smith College of Music for 27 years. Currently, he serves on the Percussive Art Society Drum Set Committee and is a member of the Modern Drummer, Remo, and Vic Firth education teams. David has authored multiple books including Mastering the Tables of Time. It was voted the number one education book in the Modern Drummer 2009 Reader's Poll. Let David help you find your beat. Please visit www.davidstanekschoolofdrumming.com. David Stanek is spelled D-A-V-I-D-S-T-A-N-O-C-H, schoolofdrumming.com. Again, the David Stanek School of Drumming. You've been listening to Minnesota Drummer. Minnesota Drummer is copyright 2020, all rights reserved. Any content played or viewed during this broadcast is used with permission, is copyright of their respective owners, and is used for promotional purposes only. No part of this broadcast can be edited, reproduced, and cannot be sold. Please look us up and follow us on our various social media sites. You can follow us at minnesotadrummer.com. There you'll find our contact forum where you can give us feedback and recommend a drummer. Thank you for listening.